First of all, I want to thank you so much for taking time out to uh, chat with us, to have an interaction with us. Uh, I'm sure your schedule must be super busy, but we're super honored to have you here. Oh Finally, get a chance to talk to you, man. That's so kind. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, just to begin things off, I'm excited to sit down for an edition of Rolling Stone India Spotlight with no one else than Dhruv. Dhruv is a British-born, Singapore-raised singer-songwriter and producer, uh, with of course Indian roots. Uh, Dhruv's eclectic musical taste blends R&B with his distinct, uh, with his distinct vocal abilities. Your debut. Your single "Double Take" went absolutely viral on mm-hmm. TikTok and on Instagram, leading to your chart-topping album "Rapunzel" as well. 10 million monthly Spotify listeners, uh, as well as 90 million streams of "Double Take," and you have "Private Blizzard" coming out. We're excited to have you, Dhruv. Oh my God, that's such a nice introduction. I'm so honored. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, man. Can you, I, before we get th- get things uh, rolled off, can you tell me a bit about "Private Blizzard," the album, the concept behind it, how it came to be? Yeah. So I had obviously after finishing "Rapunzel." I was very perplexed. I I didn't really know what I wanted to do next for a bit because, as amazing as the success of it was, it definitely was thinking about how do I convert this moment into a career. How do yeah. I? What's my next move? And I think initially I was quite paralyzed by the idea of making the next thing. Mm-hmm. And for a while, I had a few months in LA where I was just making absolutely trash music <laughs> and. Not coming up with anything good. The label was stressed. I was stressed. It was sort of like a miserable thing. Went home for a bit. Kind of found my love for music again by just doing it the way that I used to do it, which yeah. was just me and the piano. And eventually, somehow got connected with somebody in Nashville, a producer uh-huh. in Nashville. And so I went to Nashville in the U.S. And that's kind of where I made the entire album. It's a very live album, and I think it's very true to kind of yeah. That the way of my process, which starts with live instruments and builds yeah. upon that. Amazing. A, a lot of people, uh, whenever artists are in a sort of headspace where they're working on a new project or sort of trying to brainstorm a creative path forward, a lot of artists that uh, I've spoken to, they they they've come to the conclusion that creativity is often found in several other sources. Uh, you might be inspired from something that you see on the street, some right. song that you hear. Can you walk me through your creative process behind uh, Private Blizzard? Yeah. I um, w- was very drawn to music that I had grown up listening to, so I was listening to a lot of like the soul records of like when I around the time I was growing up. So yeah. I revisited albums like Twenty One, Frank by yeah. Amy Winehouse, Rock Fairy by Duffy, and listened to that. Listened to a lot of that music in addition to things that I hadn't really listened to all that much or hadn't done a, a massive deep dive into. Mm-hmm. So I like revolvers, like one of the Beatles albums that I hadn't like that I had listened to, but I was like really studying, really listening to um, for for this album. And then I also just feel like it was a process of of kind of also just tuning into myself a bit more mm-hmm. because I had gotten a bit thinking too hard about what mm-hmm. other people were going to think about things, and for me that meant just like familiarizing myself with. Or refamiliarizing myself with my own process and just being, yeah, yeah. I I read somewhere. I think you mentioned this on Instagram, uh, and I and I love this line from Margaret Atwood's poem "City Planners." Mm. Uh, this is where the city planners, with insane faces of political conspirators, <laughs> scattered across unsurveyed territories. And is that where you drew inspiration for the title "Private Blizzard"? So it's from the poem itself, and I think the poem is so interesting because it's there's so many different interpretations of it. It's obviously. You know something that she's really good at is is doing like this sort of dystopian thing, and I think I the it the poem less than the specific line mm-hmm. where she she writes about you know these these planners eat being each in their own private blizzard. That's a line that's always stuck with me. I think it is such a great description of how like we move through the world as humans, mm-hmm. like in in public places. The idea of sitting next to somebody and not really knowing or understanding what. Is going on in their head, yeah. And so much of this, the process of making this album was, I'd be sitting in coffee shops, I'd be sitting in outside or in hotel lobbies, and I would be like writing these really intense songs, yeah. writing these really intense lyrics, and I would, I the contrast of me sitting there and doing that next to people who had no no idea that I was like in this my own like spiral spiraling in my own way, yeah. Um, Felt very true, and then also I think the other thing about the title that I really like is that it, in some way, represents the sound of the album. So you have, the, the first part, the private, being like the 
intimate style of the writing and mm -hmm. it feeling quite confessional, but the blizzard being the sound, the actual sound of the album. So being very maximal, yeah. having lots and lots of instruments, leaning on the side of something that's maybe feels more wintry than it mm -hmm. does, like bright and summery. And so it felt like the title that encapsulated all of those ideas. And you're, when, when you're in the studio, when you're working on this album, obviously there is a great degree of control that you probably have and want to have on your own music. But do you still think there's a collaborative nature even when it's <clears throat> driven entirely by yourself? Yeah, definitely. This album more than my first one. My first one was like, so it was such an insular process. It was me and a couple of friends. With this album, I really felt like I needed to work with people who would also get me out of my own head a little yeah. bit. And people who would... Um, like not just be yes people, people who would be honest with me mm -hmm. about the music that I was making and help me get there and then help me put and, and, and push it there. And so the main collaborator that I worked on, worked worked on this album with it was a guy named JT, JT Daly. So he's amazing. But I worked with a few other people, a couple of other people in London who, who I started some stuff with and in the US as well. So it was a, a bit more collaborative than my first one. Very cool. And uh, obviously you've, uh, you've, you've come to Bombay, you've come to India. Uh, have you had any uh, thoughts or opinions on the Indian music scene here, any independent artists that have caught your attention? Uh, the recent one would obviously be Hanu on Kind. Of course. I think I saw that video um, and... I, I think I'd seen it just like slightly before it went viral because we have some mutuals yeah. and I thought it was the most insane thing ever. Right. And then to see it like catch fire in the way that it has is, it's so great also because we exist in a time right now where labels and business businesses don't want to fund videos. Mm -hmm. They think that videos are like, why, why fund a video? Everybody's interested in the 30 second thing that's broken yeah. down. So to see something like that kind of take off in the way that it has is amazing. And the scene here is great. I, know, I mean, Yashraj is another person yeah. that I know, super talented. Pratik Kohad, mm -hmm. somebody that I have hung out with a couple of times, really, yeah. really like him. So it's a great, I mean, it's a great Absolutely. booming scene. How do you approach when, when you have to make your own music video? Because I've seen a lot of your <laughs> visuals and they're so, um, I, I hate to use the word dynamic, but there's so much happening, but at the same time, it is quite minimal. Yeah. Uh, is that intentional? Do you have a certain way and how you approach your visual identity? Definitely. I think I've, I know my strengths, right? Like I'm not going to be doing like dancing or anytime soon, at least, maybe in the, the far future. <laughs> But I think it's knowing your strengths. I'm naturally a more introverted person. Mm -hmm. And so I don't really feel the need to do... To me, the best way to represent the music is to sort of represent the way that I move about the world, the way yeah. that I like approach the world. And that yeah. is often a way that is a bit more dialed down, a bit more subtle. Yeah. And so that's where the whole minimal idea comes from. But with this album specifically, it felt important to be... Given so much of the album was written outside of the studio, given right. the album title hints at the fact that it's, you know, this kind of being in your own world outside... Um, it felt important to shoot the videos outside and not right. do them in like a studio space and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, do you, uh, of course, your live shows, uh, whenever you're performing in front of a large crowd, do you think you've managed to encapsulate the same energy that you went in writing your album with whenever you get to see an audience in front of you? I think so. I haven't really performed this album in full yet mm -hmm. at all. And I've done a few of the songs. So it's going to be interesting to see what the arrangement was. I did like a performance earlier in the year that I had a full band for and it felt very right for yeah. this album specifically. Yeah. So I'm excited to see where, where it goes and to, to just do it on like the on the bigger scale. Yeah, absolutely. And do you have any specific markets, any cities that you're excited to check out? I mean, I'm definitely coming back to India, of absolutely. course. Absolutely. But I, I mean, I, ha I haven't been to like, like I haven't been to Japan. I haven't been, there's so many places that I still haven't been to yet to perform. What's like one place that you definitely have to cross off for this particular? I really want to go to like Sydney, which is such a okay. random one. But Australia is like, it feels so like on the other side of the world. <laughs> yeah, and I quite literally. <laughs> quite, it was very literally, but also like never, never, uh, you know, done anything there musically. Yeah. So that one seems to be like one that people also ask me to come to. So I want to go there. Very cool. Uh, after finishing a piece like uh, Project Blizzard, an album in that capacity, uh, a lot of times you, you, it, there is a sense of releasing something into the world uh, yeah. and, and you kind of have to let go of a project, an idea that you have after a point. Did you find yourself struggling with that idea of like, hey, I'm finally done with it. Now I'm ready for the world to see it. Uh, no, not at all. Honestly, like... It's like so exciting to me to think that it's going to come out in the world because making your first album, and I've heard other artists say this as well, but I I really feel this way. My first full length album is like something that you wanted to do for a while yeah. and making it to such a, if I think back to obviously double take, but also pre double take, the, like the years before that, that I was writing songs, yeah. looking for this collaborator, 
dreaming essentially to make an album, it feels like you wonder at many points whether it's going to be something that you achieve, whether you actually make one. Mm. So for me, it's like it it, it feels like it's going to give me some some brain space to be yeah. like think about what I want to do next within the music and. I'm excited to feel to feel that. Yeah, do you, is it a sense of relief that you feel after you're done, after you're done with an album? A hundred percent. Obviously, a sense of pride. Yeah. But definitely a sense of relief because, yeah, it's hard to see in the middle where it's gonna go and what shape it's gonna take and, yeah, there are always so many moving variables. Yeah. So how does the? I'm curious to know how virality kind of fits into this picture because yeah. uh, oftentimes when you see one of your songs uh, blow up in the way that uh, you have on TikTok and in Instagram, yeah. does that change the way you approach your songwriting process? Is it something that you see as like a, it's it's happened and you embrace it? It's um, doesn't change the way that you approach it, but I definitely I would be lying if I said it. It didn't. It it was easy to not think about it because. Mm. And maybe that's just a part of being in like the music business as opposed to just doing music because you love it. Mm-hmm. Is this whole idea of like, oh, like there are people who are going to be wanting to hear the next thing that you make, and yeah. it definitely adds a level of pressure. Doesn't influence the way that I make things at the beginning. Like, there's external pressure, lots of external pressure coming from people around around you to be like, what's the next song? What's it going to be? What are you going to do next? Blah blah blah. But I think, for me. I don't think I'd make anything good if if I was that was if I was thinking too hard about too it. Too hard about virality you know I mean? specifically. Yeah. I would make bad music. I feel you. I feel like a lot of artists in fact try to toe that line in a mm. specific way where on one hand you do want the attention that virality provides yeah. but at the same time does that in any way lead you away from staying authentic, staying true to your own craft, yeah. you know? And I feel like especially in an industry like the Indian music industry where you never know overnight who might blow up because of whatever reason, because yeah. of audience interaction. It becomes incredibly difficult for artists to kind of figure that right path out. Um, I, I kind of wanted to talk about the involvement of a label, uh, especially one as big as RCA that has supported you for this one. Yeah. Um, do you find yourself, uh, how much of an involvement have they had? Do you find yourself grateful for the resources perhaps that they provide you as well? Definitely grateful for the resources, grateful for the infrastructure. A label is a, a very... Du- Signing up with the label is such a personal decision, right? Yeah. And at the time of making that decision, it definitely felt like the right move. Just in just because I being an independent musician, which is I was for the longest time, is is great in so many ways. You obviously have your music, and you get to time it and do whatever you want. And but it's also like sometimes you're wondering like, what am I doing here? Yeah. You'll wake up and be like, what am I doing here? Yeah. Like, I'm not backed by anything. And so I think if that's something that's important to a specific artist, then I, you know, I would recommend it. But also like, I don't think there's a need for one either. Yeah, I feel you. Like you can do it. You can do it by yourself. You can do it by yourself. You definitely can do it by yourself. And as far as my label's involvement, I'm definitely grateful for the help. But like, I see, I see both ways. I think if the label is what you need for those reasons, then do it. If it's yeah. not, then just be. That's such an interesting point because uh, it's a great segue as well for my next question. Is that you obviously have such a large uh, young fan base uh, yeah. of people who perhaps look at not only a genre but your approach to songwriting in a way that could be inspirational towards them. Um, I want to know one thing, obviously, about any interactions that you had with fans, mm-hmm. anything that may stick out, and secondly, is there. Any specific advice that you would give to younger listeners who may be looking at your career as a, a potential blueprint uh, to mm-hmm. something that they might want to do? Uh, yeah, two great questions. As far as fan interactions, I just like routine, routinely, like really nice people, yeah. like come up to me and stuff, and it's 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 like, yeah, it's it like I really, really, really like genuinely like talking to yeah. my fans. I, I think there's just like the most like generous with their time, just cool, chill yeah. people. Um, You've never gotten like a weird fan interaction moment or anything. I mean, they've been, they they <laughs> definitely have been, but like even that, it's like it's been harmless. So like okay. you know, drunk, really drunk people in the crowd, and you know that kind of thing. Which <laughs> yeah, is like of whatever. course. That's like to be expected, yeah, know, especially right. when you're playing like in the U.S. I was doing my early tours where like you know some of the more bar venues and stuff so it's, does any instant come to mind where something <laughs> something has happened there was yeah there was a show that i did in um, washington dc where a drunk girl like she got up and she like laid down on the stage on stage on stage amazing in front of me <laughs> okay so that was interesting yeah i can imagine so i had to stop the i had to stop the song and it was like because you also 
in those kinds of moments, like you want to make sure that the person's also okay, right? Like you have to be so drunk to do that, yeah. to, to to consider doing that in front of people. Right. So there's that, but then there's also like, oh god, like the audience is going to watch me interact with this <laughs> on stage, publicly. on stage, yeah. which is like also kind of terrifying. So that one, that whole experience was definitely that definitely a, a weird one that stuck right. out to me. Right. Absolutely. And as far as like advice to like listeners and stuff, I would just say like, I mean just keep showing up for for it like just you know keep making music even when you don't feel inspired yeah that's like the best piece of advice that i got because there's so many days where there's so many days in this in the process of making this the process of making the first one where i was like i don't know how to make music but the key is just to kind of keep showing up for it and honing in on your craft and then eventually yeah. drawing people to you rather than like reaching out to a label or whatever. Absolutely. Uh, and Dhruv, uh, we're all excited to check out Private Blizzard. And um, do you have anything that you can share with us about the next steps forward? Is there any tour that we can expect? Uh, any dates that we could keep in mind? I'll definitely be back in Asia next year, which will mm-hmm. be really fun for this upcoming year. I'm opening for um, a different act in Europe and then I'm touring the US early next year. Okay. So I'll just be you know on tour throughout on tour to throughout traveling around absolutely are there really any collaborators that uh, any surprises that we can expect with the uh, people you might be working with perhaps on a deluxe version but for this, okay. for the existing version no okay Just lovely me. hell yeah Dhruv it's been a pleasure getting a chance to speak with you, thank uh, you for me. this has been Dhruv for Rolling Stone India Spotlight it's a pleasure to have you my man thank you for having me absolutely cheers man